Welcome to the Northern Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand. I'm the Covenant Horns of Odin. And today I'm joined by Ella Shevchikova. And we're going to talk about Loki, I believe. Yeah, hi. I'm Ella. I'm a um, second year PhD student at the uh, Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. Um, glad to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining. So what do you, do you want to just give a quick rundown about what we're going to talk about, what the the episode is mainly going to focus on? Uh, sure. Well, um, I'm writing my thesis on Loki, um, and I'm looking at pretty much anywhere that Loki comes up in um, Old Norse texts, and I'm looking at the actual manuscript source material rather than printed editions of um, these texts, and then I'm looking at um, how Loki's gender um, kind of comes through and how Loki interacts with uh, gender boundaries and um, what that means for um, kind of gender in these texts that Loki's in. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it's going to be a fascinating episode and we're going to yeah, we're going to have some fun with it. I hope so. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, Loki is certainly one of the most fascinating characters, I think, within all of Nordic mythology. He's, whether people love him, hate him, for whatever, he's he's certainly a, a prominent and very involved figure. Yeah, he's one of the more common... Um characters that show up in edit poems um, and then in parts of what's um, usually printed as the prose edda, so Gilfaginning and Stalstop and Mull. Um, yeah, he um, gets up to a lot of mischief. Um, <laughs> Lives up to his name. Absolutely. So how, how often does he appear compared to Odin, Thor, the the big hitters, if you will, like is he appearing in a lot of texts? Yeah, so he appears in um, seven Eddic poems, and he has quite a few stories in um, Gilvaginning and in Stalstop and Mall, parts of the uh, Prose Edda, um, and he's not quite as um, prominent maybe as Odin and Thor. Um, I haven't really looked closely at the the other two, and so I can't tell you exactly how many times he appears compared mm -hmm. to them. But he's definitely um, after them, um, sort of one of the most prominent mm -hmm. characters of the feature. Does he ever does he ever feature on his own? Because I, I I kind of just thought of this now that every time I think of Loki in a story, it's almost as a a sidekick or a side member to a story and he's there making mischief. So I think in most of the stories and the poems, there's actually groups of gods um, or groups of these deities. Um, they very rarely appear completely on their own. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of poems, Lokasenna and Thrymskveda, where Loki plays a particularly important role. In terms of that, I think Thor is um, the star of the show. But in Lokasenna, it's really all about Loki, and he goes around insulting yeah. everybody. Yeah, as soon as, you, as soon as you mentioned that, that reminded me that, yeah, that is definitely Loki-centric. He also plays a pretty big role in Ragnarok. So he steers this big um, ship made of um, fingernail clippings. Um, and he leads this army of giants against the gods. So he's also pretty prominent, but he's maybe not the main character in Ragnarok. <laughs> yeah. I know this is off topic already, but that ship has haunted me ever since I first read it. That's it's a horrible concept. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know who came up with that or how, whether maybe somebody just cut their toenails or fingernails and was like, yeah, that's a pretty horrible thing. But like... I don't even know how the concept comes up because it feels like toenails, fingernail clippings are just not, by any stretch of the imagination, the best material for making a ship for. First of all, they're small. It's very difficult to get them together to make a ship from. The logistics is terrible. 
It really is. Um, but I think that's part of the point that it's supposed to be horrible and disgusting because Loki's changed sides and he's mm. fighting um, the gods, you know, and he's yeah. um, that kind of shiver that goes up your spine. I think that's the whole point. Yeah. It, and it shows that even a thousand years ago or more, you know, when, when these were first created, I guess, that people still thought fingernail and toenail clippers were fucking minging. It's, it's something that's just never died. It's, just, it's probably always been there. Absolutely. <laughs> just, yeah. Something's <laughs> they, never changed. They, they really don't. And I, I find that always fascinating. It's just human nature that nobody likes fingernail clippings. It's just not nice. Uh, <laughs> okay, where where would you say is is best to delve into this? Is there a a good starting point when it comes to Loki and and gender, I guess, is the or for me anyway, maybe you're gonna take me in a, on a different path. But, but I guess for me the, the 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 main one is Loki and his gender identity, I guess. Yeah, gender identity is a pretty big part of it. Um although now that you said starting point, um I've kind of for my PhD project, the kind of starting point I actually took was the manuscript. Um, and it all comes down to the question of kind of what is a medieval text, right? And most people, when they look at sort of Norse mythology, they think of the Eddas, right? The Poetic Edda, the Prose Edda, or Snorri's Edda. Um, but actually, neither of these is really a medieval text. They're both sort of collections that have just been printed because they're um, related material. Um, and with neither of them, there's no sort of medieval manuscript that actually has all the poems of the Poetic Edda or all of the texts of the Prose Edda together. Um, so there's manuscripts that have some of the Eddic poems, and there's manuscripts that have Stolz Kapanmal, Gilvaginning, Haltatal, um, the prologue, all these parts of the, the prose edda, but none of the manuscripts actually have all four of these in the same order that they're printed in the um, prose edda. Um, so what I did was I actually went back to the manuscripts and looked at so sort of which texts are actually in which manuscript, um, and are we actually justified in looking at Loki um, in the Prosetta and the Poetic Edda. Okay. Do you do you have to translate them? Are you able to translate them from the original texts? Or do you have to look at do you, do you just look at the order and then use modern translations or other people's translations? How does how does that work? So I've studied Old Norse um as part of my BA and Masters, um, okay. and also paleography, so the study of manuscripts and scripts um so i can actually read the manuscripts oh that's um, gonna be handy for when you when you because obviously things can get lost in other people's translations which i think people sometimes don't realize that you know you can read two different people's translations of the poetic edda and they can read different because they've translated it differently absolutely um but it's not even just about the translations um it's also about the edition so how you get from a manuscript to a printed text of an Old Norse text. Um, so in the manuscripts, they really try and save as much space as possible. Um, so when you have poetry, for example, it's not laid out line by line, it's all continuous. And a lot of words are abbreviated as well. Um, and then manuscripts would be copied from each other. So sometimes the scribes would make mistakes or someone would just write down the wrong word um, or they'd write down something that doesn't quite make sense. So already when you're sort of printing this as a book, um, as an old Norse text, um, there's already quite a lot of editing that goes into that. You're changing the layout, you're changing some of the spelling. Um, quite often um, things are spelled in a different way. So with Loki, half the time his name is spelled with a C in the manuscripts. Okay. Sometimes even in the same text, in the same sentence, you get one with a K and one with a C. Um, so there's really a whole um, Is there process. a reason for that? Do we know why that might be um it's just that the spelling wasn't standardized yet um so in europe in the 19th century um 
in various countries, there was this movement to kind of standardize spelling and make sure that everyone was spelling everything in the same way. But in the Middle Ages, anything went. It just seems so bonkers. I like I understand in different texts or even in maybe even on a different page. But if like it's from one line to the next, it just seems so bizarre that they just wouldn't think, oh, I've spelled it there with a C, so I'm gonna do that in the next one. Why it's always like they wanted to make it difficult for you. Um maybe it partly comes down to Loki kind of being fluid and they were even expressing that through the spelling that um you know he's not quite fixed, he's not quite stable. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you know his shape's not quite stable um or his gender identity. Maybe. Yeah maybe I guess who would I do do you see the same kind of spelling with other gods? I'm actually not sure. Um, I think with Odin and Thor, it's fairly similar. I don't remember seeing a lot of variants for them, um, but I haven't really looked into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I guess my first question has to be, in, in, in texts like this, do you get, because obviously, yeah, I've, I've not read the original wouldn't know how to wouldn't know a start. So do you get like will it say he when when talking about anybody or or she if it came to like a, a male god or a female god, would it say like he does this? You know how we have a story today. I, that's how kind of like, we're used to stories. They it'll say he says, I went to the park. I don't know. Do you get that in these texts where you can kind of go, oh, okay, this is a male or this is a, a female that is now doing something or in terms of like with Loki, does it say like he changed into a horse? Yeah, they absolutely did use personal pronouns. Um and it's actually that's, much a better, that's such a better way of putting it than I how I put it. Um yeah, I mean the um there are characters who actually change gender. Um so for example these um maiden kings sagas um when these women sort of take on the male role and the male identity and they take on the male name as well the text refers to them actually with male pronouns and then usually they get married at the end um and then they switch back to sort of female pronouns um yeah but i think for loki pretty consistently um the text use um male pronouns that refer to him as he okay um when although Oh, just when Sorry. you said, uh, no, no, don't, don't apologize. I, this is one thing you'll, you'll see that I just kind of get questions that pop up into my head about something you've said, and I'll just kind of, I'll go with it. So when you, when you were saying then about the, the ladies that turn into, or oh, their, their pronouns change to he, and then you said they got married, do they get married to men or women and then turn back into the female pronoun? That's what I, is that stated? Oh, they get married to men. Okay, so they get married to men and then they become women yeah. again, I guess? Yeah, they sort of revert back to their, I don't know, previous um, yeah, gender identity. Do they, is there a reason why they, they change into, into men or have the male pronoun? Is it, because obviously um, we see it at time and time again, don't we, with females who want to become warriors, you will get, it happened with, I know it's certainly happened with like pirating and I'm pretty sure it probably happened in the Viking age. Well, you'll get women who dressed up as men so they could go along because it was more acceptable, I guess. Is it something possible that it's something like that where it's, they're taking like a warrior role and then when they get married, they then turn back into the female. Yeah. Um, it's not exactly my area, but I think there is an element of them sort of wanting to kind of go to war and to learn to fight and um, to kind of do these masculine things. Um, but sometimes there's also an element of necessity that maybe um, they're an only child and they're their father's sort of only heir. So they're the only kind of descendant oh, wow. that can okay. take on the... Um, and she can't do it as a woman, and so she has to sort of go out and fight and earn her name kind of as a man. Okay. Okay. That's that's fascinating. Uh, okay, sorry. You had something to say about, about Loki before I dragged us off to the side. 
Oh, yes, I think um, I was going to say that when Loki actually changes shape into um, an animal, I think he turns into a flea a couple of times, he turns into um, a bird, he turns into a horse. Um, then a salmon? He sort of... Is he turned into a salmon? Yep, a salmon as well. Uh, he hides in a waterfall mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, before he gets bound. Um, but yeah, but then he's sort of referred to as um, the horse or the um salmon or whatever animal it is oh okay so he would he wouldn't keep his male pronoun whilst being well saying that he becomes a i guess he becomes a female horse um i guess i guess he must take a female pronoun i think it depends on the um the gender of the animal so old norse mm -hmm. is a gendered language so every noun has its own gender. Okay. Um, so I think with the horse, it's a mare, so it would be feminine pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, with the salmon, I think that is a masculine noun, but I am not sure on that <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> I guess it's it's not as important with the salmon, but it is quite important with the with the mare or with the horse. Yep. So I guess. And that's for me anyway, that's as good a place as any to maybe start or to delve into this because it feels like that and obviously the one where Thor and Loki go and get Thor's hammer back. They're the two that stand out for me that would fit into this topic, unless there are ones that I'm missing that you think are more obvious. So I'm writing a lot about Lokasen now, which is this poem where Loki goes around insulting all of the other gods. Um, and that's also quite an interesting one because um, Loki sort of attacks their femininity, their masculinity. He takes different attitudes to gods compared to goddesses. Um, so that's also quite a, an interesting one in terms of gender. But definitely um, Kvela, where they go get Thor's hammer back, um, is also a great one. And then the um yeah the story where he turns into a mare mm -hmm. okay let's if we hmm because I, I i'm trying to think where's where where's best to start let's go with let's start with loki as a as a horse because i guess my interest is is in him or Loki as as a deity and how he's seen and I with just Loki and and what kind of that is because I guess with the, the with the one with with Thor it's the two of them who who dress up and maybe that's more of a broader look and the Loki center is more how Loki is looking at the others so if we start maybe with just Loki as a as a figure and how his gender is seen and and how that works, particularly in him obviously changing into a, a female horse. Well, the idea of Loki being a deity actually is not super clear, um, I would say, um, because he's sort of presented um, or he's named as uh, one of the Aesir uh, in Gilvaginning, um, but he's also... Um, descended from a giant. So his father's name is Falbote, and um, he is one of the giants, and his mother um, is a goddess. Um, so Loki's not just um, kind of a trickster or a um, kind of disruptive um, member of the, of the gods, but he's also, it's not entirely clear whether he is a god in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of also um, there's a case to be made for saying that that then is what allows him to be so flexible in his gender um, that that's what also allows him to kind of cross other boundaries okay because he's I guess because he's an outsider almost that it's it's not as it wouldn't be seen as strict yeah um, and to take a kind of um, 
religious historical perspective, there's no place names that relate to Loki. There's no um, cult sites of Loki that we know of. Um, so it's entirely possible that um, Loki wasn't really worshipped um, mm -hmm. at all. And there's even a theory that he wasn't actually around in um, pre-Christian times. So he's actually, he only appears in the texts um, from Iceland from the 13th century. Okay. Is that the case that he only appears in the... Well, it's really difficult to say. Um, so we have not very much archaeological evidence. Um, so we have a few kind of picture stones um, that could be located, but it's also um, very difficult to say. There's one from um, Sweden from the 9th century. There's, I think, the Gosforth Cross from England. Um, it's also quite early. Um, and there's the sort of Van Devil or Loki stone, which you mentioned you actually saw the other day. Yeah, I did. Um, I, went, I went up to see it and did some some reading on it. And yeah, I think that's from the, the ninth century as well. But again, it's it's one of those stones. So for, uh, we'll, put, we'll put it in when we post. Um, and also, if, if you follow me, Daniel and Scott Farron, one on Instagram, I, I'm going to post a video on it. And for people that are listening, it's a figure that looks... Almost devilish, I guess. He's got ram's horns and was either maybe a beard or a v-neck tunic, but he's definitely bound or the figure is bound. It's got like a ring bindings and it's there's like a some sort of what looks like a fabric that's that's binding him. Um and yeah, like you say, it's called the Loki Stone or the Bound Devil Stone. But I knew of it. I knew of it by name as the Loki Stone, so I went looking at it as Loki because I'm like, oh yeah, it's Loki. It makes sense. He got bound to the stone for you know causing the death of Baldur. His punishment was to be bound to the stone and stay there until Ragnarok. So you kind of just look at it and go, oh, well, that's clearly Loki from the the story. That's what it is. And um, but then is it because we know that story? Maybe that story is not from. The, the the or not pre-christian um and then you just kind of so you kind of you're saying it is loki because you just assume it is from what you know and maybe it's the wrong way around yeah exactly i mean there's not a lot of evidence that's left over and what there is is from sort of different time periods uh different geographical spaces um so it's very tempting when we kind of see something that sort of fits into our view of of um nordic mythology to kind of say ah oh, yeah that's that's that thing that's located down mm. to the stone yeah you want um, it to be as well i want it i want it exactly. because it's like what i'm interested in yeah definitely um but it is so important to remember that um we really don't have a lot of evidence and there's no sort of one pre-christian religion you know like um religion in the year 500 in Denmark would have been very different to um, the year 900 in Iceland, for example, or in 800 in Northern Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, yeah. I guess it, I guess we'd, we'd maybe jumping forward a little bit. If, if, if there's no evidence for a Loki to be worshipped at the time, but like you say, I guess it, if there's not really any evidence that maybe even existed at the time, um, I was going to ask why you you think there's such a an interest in worshiping him in modern times. But maybe that's a question we can leave for for later on before we, because I feel like that might take us way off topic. Sure. I mean, I guess I can quickly say that um, you know the text sort of. Um, about Loki, you know, the earliest ones that we have are from um, 13th century Iceland, but it, there's a long history of reception. So the texts get sort of adapted and recycled and retold. Um, and I wouldn't say necessarily that there's one telling that's sort of more authentic or more real or more proper than any other. I mean, by the time the texts were, the earliest texts that currently survive were written down in, in Iceland, it was already... 200, 250 years at least um, since the conversion to Christianity. So they were already kind of 
folklore, they were sort of cultural heritage texts, and that's also how they're framed, for example, in the the uh, prologue to the um, prose Edda, that actually, you know, we shouldn't believe in these things, but this is what our ancestors believed in, and these are the stories that they told, um, and they help us understand our poetry, and this is why we need to remember them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let, okay, let's jump back to to Loki just as as an individual, yeah, and what we can understand about his his gender, I guess, and his gender identity. Because I, it seems like for the most part he is a male, um, and then a, other than is there any examples other than him changing into the mayor? Is there any other examples of fluidity there? So Loki, um, that depends on how you kind of see fluidity and how you see the norm and how you kind of see masculinity. Um, so Loki transgresses lots of different boundaries and not just gender. So we've already um, spoken about sort of race, that he's sort of half giant and mm -hmm. half isolated. Um and there's also shape, so he changes um, shape quite a lot into a lot of different animals, um, including the mare. Um, and he also, with the giantess Agnaboda, he has his three children, Fenre, the wolf, uh, Jodmungandr, the world serpent, um, and Hel. Um, and these three children are really seen as, um, I don't know, kind of fruits of nature. Mm -hmm. um, by the other gods and they really try to contain them like they bind the wolf um and they sort of banish the serpent to the sea um and they banish hell to sort of the the underground um so they really kind of see loki as a threat um and his uh having these children with this giantess is also um seen as quite transgressive mm -hmm. yeah it does it really does seem everything <laughs> everything bad comes through loki in one way or another Yeah, um, he's definitely causing a lot of mischief um, in a lot of the myths, but he's also kind of set up that way. Like in uh, Thumskveda, when Thor loses his hammer, he sort of he wakes up, and the first person that he decides to call is Loki. You know, he he discovers his hammer is missing, and he's immediately like, "This must be Loki's fault." Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he wasn't wrong. It's not actually clear in the poem that it was oh, okay. Loki's fault. Okay. Um, sometimes it is Loki's fault, but sometimes we just kind of assume, like also in the in the giant builder myth where he turns into a mare, um, it sort of says that, you know, all the, the gods decided that it was Loki's fault, but he persuaded them to make this agreement with the builder. Um, but it's not, you know, they also made the agreement. They could have just said no they kind of blame loki but it kind of leaves you wondering like is he just the scapegoat for them and loki gets threatened with torture quite a lot um quite often he helps the gods or he solves their problems just because they sort of have threatened to torture him and it's quite it's quite sad yeah kinda but i feel like he he brings it on himself maybe yeah There's... But I wouldn't really say that anyone deserves to be tortured, you know, even if they have caused a bit of a mess. No, and... I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they deserve to be tortured, but I think it's. I mean, it certainly. I, I I don't always agree with the argument. Oh, it's a different time, but it certainly was a different time where things were dealt with with violence, probably a lot more acceptably than today. I mean, sure, violence, but torture is not really something that comes up for the other gods. I think torture is something where you're really putting someone in a helpless position, and that's kind of different to this aggressive violence that we see mm -hmm. in a lot of the old Norse texts. It's kind of, um, it's showy, it's kind of someone asserting their own strength um, against somebody else, and it's not sort of taking somebody captive and sort of containing someone, um, I think is a slightly different thing. Do we, okay. Well, do we, do we get any, 
stories to compare to where you get other gods who maybe make mistakes or do things that would displease the god where maybe they would be treated differently do we do we have that i guess i can't think of a a story other than it's always is loki isn't it where these things happen where when something goes wrong it's loki it's a it, it's attributed to him yeah i think so so i guess there isn't there isn't that comparison as to whether anybody might have, another god may have been treated nicely or without the threat of torture yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. Okay. Is there what other boundaries is does Loki break or or bend? Um. So, for example, there's uh, in Lokasana the use of magic. Um. So it's actually he accuses Odin of using Sabred, um, which is a kind of magic that was usually associated with um, the feminine and sort of male practitioners mm -hmm. were, um, yeah, kind of um, seen as not conforming to gender. Okay. Um, and Odin throws that accusation right back at him. You know, he says, oh, you were feminine as well. Um, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess they're just slinging, slinging shit at each other, I guess. Pretty much. So is is, uh, is that? Yeah, I'm guessing that's used as an insult. Then, so I, as I guess, then it's, it's we can we can take from that that it's deemed negative or at least offensive to call a man feminist or feminist feminine at the time. Yeah, this is pretty consistent across a lot of different texts, but. Um... Yeah, the association with femininity and also particular um, aspects of kind of being effeminate. Um, so, for example, in Thrymskvila, when Thor and Loki dress up as women, um, that's kind of seen as quite demeaning. And Thor is really, um, he really protests. He really doesn't want to. And actually, when he gets dressed up as a woman, he doesn't say anything else for the rest of the poem until he turns back, until he takes off the disguise. You know, Loki speaks for him. He becomes completely passive. He even gets dressed by him and, and Loki. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that kind of association between femininity and passivity. Mm -hmm. with, with that story in particular, how much is, or can that be attributed to maybe like Christian influence and wanting to demean the gods in a way, I guess, does it predate sort of Christianity in a sense that it, it, it seems as though with a lot of stories, Christian, Christians have tried to put in little ideas to make the gods look weak or look human or embarrass them. Um, I guess with Utgard the Loki, the, the whole thing is to make Thor look like he can't do the tasks and with the the Gosforth cross you mentioned earlier I think there's a scene on that where Thor's looking for um fishing for Yomanganda and he can't kill Yomanganda but then above that scene God is standing on a snake and the whole thing is kind of like oh yeah you, your God can't do it but our God's almighty he can kill the serpent so there is that kind of demeaning factor. And that's the one I've always wondered with that story in particular, whether that's maybe a part of it. Yeah, it's a good question. But it's actually kind of impossible to say now what is Christian influence and what's not, um, and what maybe even came in sort of before the conversion, because there's a lot of contact between Scandinavia and continental Europe, you know, between you know, the migration age, 400, 500 AD and 1000 when most Scandinavia converted. Um, and with something like Thermspeda, it's really tempting to say, well, look, the the gods are really being demeaned here and they're not mm -hmm. being respected. And so that must be because of Christian influence. But we really don't have a lot of evidence for what was influenced by Christianity and what wasn't. And I'm sure that there's some, you know, random things that you would never guess came from Christianity and then other things that maybe have stayed consistent, you know, mm -hmm. for hundreds of years and you wouldn't expect that either. 
or there could be a lot of um, influence even early on um, from Christianity, um, maybe when sort of during the conversion of England um, and sort of with the Viking kingdoms in the north, um, in the Danelaw, there would have been a lot of contact. Um, so even in the sort of pre-Christian period, um, there it's completely possible that a lot of you know, Christian stories that have been adapted or elements would have been kind of taken over into um, Scandinavian religion. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it must be extremely difficult to try and understand what we, I guess, what we can learn from these stories when it comes to actual gender roles or gender norms compared to what could be, or what, I guess, what a lot of the time, maybe less now, but probably I imagine... 10, 20, 30 years ago, scholars probably just attributed to Christian influence. Whereas maybe now it gets looked at in a in a slightly different light. Yeah, and that's why in my PhD, I really just treat the sources in their own context. You know, the, the surviving texts that we have are from the 13th century. So we have to look at them as 13th century sources, which, you know, present some cultural heritage. Um, and they can tell us, you know, almost nothing really conclusively um, about sort of pre-Christian religion. Mm -hmm. um, and it was quite common among um, scholars, even until quite recently, to sort of try and peel back the um, Christian sort of layers of influence. But it's really difficult to tell, mm -hmm. um, you know, exactly what that influence is and sort of when it came in and you know, pre-Christian religion itself would have shifted a lot. So, so I guess then, what or what do you think that we can learn about how they would have looked at, particularly, I guess, again with Loki, the the gender roles or gender norms of the time. Is there anything we can learn from it, or is it because obviously, with I guess with Loki, and he it kind of shows that it was seen as negative for for a, a man to be effeminate but is there can we learn is there anything we can learn from that is that was that like the general thought or were the exceptions i guess yeah is there anything we can we can take we can talk about how gender is constructed within a particular text um so we can kind of look at the gender boundaries that sort of loki trans or breaks um but i think it's very difficult to generalize out from that Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I see. It seems like it's such a complicated topic. And I guess it's what can, or how, how much do you think we can learn from, from what Loki does? How much do you think you can then maybe apply culturally down so we can learn, I guess, apply it to the peoples that lived in those times? But again, it's difficult because we don't know if. The st how old the stories are, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it's so difficult. I'm trying to think how we can, yeah, or what, what we can learn about other people that lived then. But if if at anything, we can. Yeah, so most of the texts, they kind of construct their own reality, right? It's a sort of fictional world, although fictional is quite a modern term. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, I think I would argue that it is very, very difficult to draw really any conclusions about sort of historical gender, especially based on the texts that relate to Loki, because they also don't really present a lot of human characters. Mm -hmm. And we can't really assume that what would have been okay for, you know, a deity like Loki or like Thod um, would have been acceptable for, you know, a 13th century Icelander. And actually, I think we see in Loki's poems themselves that gender norms and kind of gender expectations, they shift, not just over time and between societies, but between particular people. So like the masculinity that would have been expected from thought is quite a sort of aggressive one, um, it's quite an assertive one. Um, but it's not the only model of masculinity that we see in all Norse literature. Um, so in the Sagas of Icelanders, 
for example, there's also quite a kind of cooperative, um, compromising form of masculinity of male characters who sort of they look after their families um, and they sort of stand up to people who are mean to them. But they also look for compromise when there's compromise to be made and they don't immediately attack the first person that insults them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also portrayed quite positively and sometimes actually um, very aggressive or sort of very overly masculine saga characters like Grettir in Grettir's saga is portrayed quite, um, you know, as an exaggerated sort of um, an even counterproductive model of masculinity where he's just sort of so um, aggressive or so kind of caught up with his own honor um, and his own kind of social standing that he can't sort of compromise with anyone and he sort of ends up an outlaw and an outcast because he can't get along with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I guess is it, it's always portrayed as Thor has been a bit dumb, a bit, you know, not the smartest. Now, is that accurate? Is that kind of how it, how it is in the texts? I think so. Okay, in, so therefore that would again would show it been quite negative to be that hyper masculine. Like I guess it it has its role, you know, it, when it comes to fighting, but maybe it's not the best for all the time. Yeah, um, and I think it kind of speaks to these characters being kind of multifaceted, right? Thor is not sort of your completely ideal man. Um, but then neither is Odin or Loki or anybody else, really. An ideal man doesn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think an ideal anybody exists, to be fair. Um, I think we all have our our flaws. Even me, people listen to this. I have my flaws as well. <laughs> uh, okay, so what can we, I guess, what can we learn if we go to Loka Center and how he looks at and speaks about the gods, because am I right in thinking he's quite negative to the female gods? Does he call does he call Freya a slag or a slut? Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, he really does. Um, and actually, when he does say that Freya, he kind of sleep, uh, accuses her of sleeping around with anyone and anything. Um, Actually, Freya's uh, father, Njordur, comes to the rescue. Um, and he actually says, you know, oh, but what does it matter if a woman has a husband and a lover? You know, that's just, it happens. Accept mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's an interesting example of this kind of norm being kind of negotiated, where, you know, Loki's saying that, you know, you need to be chaste and you need to stick to your husband. And then somebody else coming in and saying, oh, well, you know, that's a bit unreasonable. Um, you know, we can we can have a little bit of of leeway, um, and also this um, accusation of of sleeping around gets thrown by Loki at um, pretty much most of the female goddesses in this poem. So it's not just Freya. I think I've said this a bunch of times on here, but obviously, like if 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 you were the wife. Of a of a soul of a, a warrior who went off a Viking, and you don't know if he's coming back in the next year, two years, or at all. Uh, of course, there's a little fun gonna go on. They, it makes complete sense that they would be, or not even not even fun, just companionship, and um, yeah, it, it's it seems silly to think that they wouldn't be. And they would be a completely monogamous society, um, in my opinion, anyway. And I think that goes for the other way around as well. I think the men that went raiding certainly wouldn't have been either. I think it's probably human nature. Um, that's my opinion. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, I guess. Yeah, I think the cultural norms shift a lot and actually um you know sex outside of marriage wasn't necessarily looked down on um in a lot of the Icelandic texts especially for men um okay. for women it was a little bit more 
but um but is that what do you think that would be a more christian influence or is that something we can't because obviously i guess in christianity it would be deemed as very negative to have sex outside of marriage now do you think that would be similar pre-christian well we do know that christianity strongly discouraged um sex outside yeah. of marriage before that it was difficult to tell i think with women you have that sort of issue of whose child is it um so that could have also potentially been a factor kind of independent of christianity for why it would be looked down on especially if women were kind of seen as property that okay. you know their husband would want to make sure that you know any children that his wife had were his mm -hmm. um but this is kind of a big gender difference that we see between the gods and the goddesses that the goddesses are really kind of looked down on for sleeping with anyone other than their husbands, whereas for the male gods, they can sleep around with whatever giantesses they want and nobody really bothers mm -hmm. about that. It's really the um, having sex with other men um, that's the problem in that case. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because I, it seems like at the at the moment there is this huge this probably very popular opinion that men and women were just purely equal during the viking age i i see it a, a lot like in facebook groups and whatnot and you had like the, yeah the, there was this just absolute equality between the two and women would have had the same, exact same rights as men and it was this almost utopian like society uh, and it doesn't seem like that's necessarily the case yeah i mean that would have been nice um but sadly um very unlikely to have been the case um so if you look at runestones for example in sweden um, I think 4% of them are put up sort of by women. Um, and I think there's maybe 10 or 15% of them that mention women in the inscriptions. And runestones were kind of considered um, to kind of be staking your claim to the land that the runestone is on. Mm -hmm. um, and so they kind of show a, a degree of power. So it, it kind of shows that women... Either they, they could own property, we see that in Iceland as well, um, but only in certain cases. So, for example, if they're widowed um, or if they're the sole heir, um, then, you know, women could get divorced in medieval Scandinavia. Um, but then also they usually couldn't choose who to marry, um, mm -hmm. certainly the first time. And then if they're widowed or divorced then sometimes they had a degree of choice but not always um and from what we know in iceland women couldn't really participate in public life um they were banned from the althingi the main sort of legal assembly in 942 mm -hmm. um and so they weren't allowed to bring their own cases they weren't really allowed to bear witness um, and they could still have a lot of informal power, they could have a lot of influence, um, but they certainly weren't um, seen as equal to men. And that also comes through in things like um, weapons and armor. Um, it's much, much rarer to see women um, buried with weapons, um, mm -hmm. sort of. And then you can kind of talk about whether they would have actually used those weapons in their life or not. Yeah. And then we have literary depictions of women with sort of weapons and armor, also very rare and violence was a way that men kind of asserted themselves and asserted their power that wasn't available to women. So, yeah, yeah. I think we can definitely say that, um, yeah, women had a lot less power than, than men in um, early Scandinavia, maybe a little bit more than women elsewhere, but still yeah. not that much. Do you think that just comes from TV shows? Because I'm trying to, I've been trying to wrap my head around where this, idea comes from and if you dare to like if you dare to question this idea with like p 
people like again in like facebook groups which i often do because i'm an asshole uh and if it's like if you dare to question it then you're all especially being a straight white male i'm the enemy uh i i'm all straight away seen as like oh you're just a fucking piece of shit asshole you don't want to accept that this is how it was and I, i've always just wondered like where this idea comes from um yeah i wonder if you had any <laughs> any thoughts on that where these kind of popular very modern popular idea comes from that things were like say almost utopian like it almost seems like people think it was better then for women than it is today which i think is insane yeah definitely um i'm not sure exactly but i'd say there's a few different factors that could contribute to that one is just pure nostalgia you know people pick their favorite period of history yeah and they kind of project their sort of hopes and dreams um onto that there's also a kind of um romantic view of especially medieval Iceland that they had these legal assemblies um the society wasn't particularly stratified um so there was no king um there were still kind of rich farmers and then not so rich farmers and then slaves um and obviously women were also um not fully able to participate in public life but compared to a lot of other places um Iceland was relatively equal in the Middle Ages, and they did have this kind of proto-parliamentary system. Um, so mm. you get this idea of sort of democracy um, and equality kind of projected um, back into the past. And it's true to an extent. There's always a grain of truth in these things. Um, but, yeah, there is still, um, you know, slavery was around. You know, if people are unfree, then... Um, you can't uh, yeah. really claim to be an equal society. I remember <laughs> this probably could upset some Icelanders, but I remember when I asked Matthias. Um, so I, Matthias Nobody, who used to host the podcast with me, I asked him about because I'd just been to Iceland, and I, as soon as you get off the airplane in in Reykjavik, there's like a there's like a little wall that says about how it was the first democracy in one thousand. And I remember asking Matthias about that, and he was just like. No, that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> it was like, no, it wasn't. And then he, I think we did an episode on this, so we can, anybody who disagrees with or is upset by what I'm saying, you can go back and listen to it. I can't remember what episode number it was, but he explains it out and he's just like, no, it wasn't, it's not that simple. Like, it wasn't a, a real democracy. I mean, depends on your definition of a real democracy. There's lots of, I know, countries with kind of parliamentary systems today that don't have, um, you know, equal rights. There's lots of, um, you know, countries where, um, you know, for example, LGBT people are discriminated against, you know, there's no sort of equal rights for women. Um, so there's really a spectrum of kind of what's democratic um, and, you know, what's truly equal. Um, I get, okay, here's a, Ooh, here's maybe a, a thought that I don't know if I want to say out loud or not. Um, <laughs> forgive me for this. Um, no, do you, okay, maybe there's an argument that the only true democracy is when nobody feels like it's actually a true democracy. Because I feel like to have a true democracy, then somebody or some people are going to feel like they've been hard done by because you can't please you could never please everybody because there is such a spectrum of people and opinions that there are always going to be people upset. So to have a true, real democracy, then you are always going to have some people who are upset with the decision. That just has to go by logic, surely. Um, I'd say partly. Um, I guess there's the similar argument that goes on round and round in the UK about sort of the BBC being truly neutral when they get accused of being um Oh, they're not fucking neutral. Partisan <laughs> from both sides. They're, um, they're not neutral. No, but I guess I guess I, I, in in the essence of like a true democracy, um I don't want to use Brexit as an example because that's a shit example. Um but if you had fifty nine percent of the the people wanting one idea and 51% of the people wanting the other 
another idea. And they're just polarizing ideas. If so by true democracy, the fifty-one percent has to win. You have to you have to go by the rules of the fifty-one percent. That's that's what a democracy is. The most people that vote. But that means you have a huge fucking section of people that are gonna be pissed and upset and feel like they're not being heard and they're not really part of a true democracy because they didn't get what they wanted. But for it to be a real democracy, you have to go with what the majority is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a really tough one. I think it kind of boils down to what system can we develop that sort of best serves the interests of most people and that kind of promotes equality um, and equity to the biggest extent that we can. And I think it's impossible to do that without pissing some people off. You know, nobody's mm -hmm. ever um, going to develop a system where absolutely everybody's happy. Um, unless you're in a brave uh, new world and you have drugs. Um, <laughs> there would still be someone upset. I'm that, sure. There's one thing, I mean, yeah, when you're talking about, well, we have in, in the UK 67 million people. Like, that's a fuck ton of people. And I think to, to, to the idea that everybody could all, always be happy, it's an impossible task. Like, I think being the leader of any country is an impossible task. I don't think you can ever please a whole country of people it's it's a, it's a day i would never want to do it no i don't think anyone wants to be rishi sunak or liz truss or boris johnson um i mean i wouldn't buy, buy being liz trust she got it for a what like a week and then gets paid for for the rest of i'm sure the prime minister gets paid for the rest they get i'm sure they get a check every year for the rest of their life once you've been prime minister so i feel like she she's come up all right I, I guess that's one way of looking at Liz Truss's premiership. <laughs> I mean, that's all you can look at. She, she yeah. wasn't there very long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get in, have a party, get out as quickly as you can, crash the economy in the process. I mean, yeah, I don't think it was just her. I think the... the, the, the oh, fuck, that was, <laughs> the last decade has probably done that. Um <laughs> we're going down a completely different rabbit hole here. Okay, let's let's get back to our topic. Uh yeah, I guess if we were if we were, last when we were on topic, I guess was Loki Center. If we we were seeing Loki use promiscuity against female uh, deities and it'd be negative, and it seems like that probably color cor correlates to actual society of human beings um do you think that then we can take other aspects and p apply that to cultural like what would be a cultural norm i think again these sort of general cultural norms are really difficult to to reconstruct and they kind of vary as well like my ideas of masculinity or femininity might be quite different from your ideas of masculinity mm -hmm. and femininity um and even if they're quite similar they're going to be slightly different and we see this in different texts um as well that they sort of have slightly different standards um even for the same characters maybe in similar kind of narratives um so i think given that there's quite a bit of variation so even within the texts that we have to then sort of extrapolate to sort of wider Scandinavian society is tricky. I think there are certain things that you can pull out, um, but it's, you know, you're always in a situation where we don't have a lot of evidence um, and we need to be really careful about making any um, conclusions mm -hmm. or feeling too strongly um, getting too attached to any particular idea. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, well, here's my idea. <laughs> I I think when you've got a, a group of people, so I, I think when you've got any group of people big enough, you're going to have all different spectrum of people within that, uh, whether it's now or it was a, a thousand years ago. And I think that that would mean that you would have people across all different spectrums of sexuality gender i think it would have just been there like you said there isn't a one-size-fit-all sure there would have been a bunch of 
hypermasculine warrior men, but there would have been a bunch of non hypermasculine and what would be classed as feminine men, and you would have had more masculine females and more feminine. It just it's, life is just a spectrum. I think it, that's true for for everything. And you would have had oh, here's one that's going to upset some people. You would have definitely have had some homosexual some homosexuality going on, and I think. That's gonna that for some reason that upsets people when you talk about this time period. Some people just get upset. It's like, well, humans are humans. Of course, it would have existed. Um, and I, yeah, I think that probably applies the same to everything that we have, whether it's trans or yeah, anything. I think you would have had some, whether it's written down or not. I think you would have had some examples, even if it's just one person. It's still that means it still existed. And I think it's a possibility. It doesn't. Yeah, we can't say for sure either way, but I think it's, in my opinion, I would say it's a probability because I think people are just people and they express themselves in the way they want to express themselves. Even we see time and time again, people express themselves in the way they in the way they want to express themselves, even if it means they're going to get killed. That's just the unfor- unfortunate truth of humans. We've seen people who will stand and do what they want to do, even if they know the consequences. So therefore, I think that would stand true for the for all of human history, and that even back then, whether it was seen in a negative light or a positive light, that people would have been people, they would have been outliers. Yeah, definitely. And this sort of, you know, desire between men or between women, it's something that is not only documented in sort of every human culture, um, we also get it with, um, you know, other mammals that there's, sort of sexual contact between sort of males and between females. Um, and yeah, it just seems like a sort of universal aspect of, of humans that, you know, why should you be attracted to um, the opposite sex just because, you know, you can reproduce with them. I think that's not, um, it's not necessarily something that's connected. Um, oh. Yeah, it's uh, that it, that that idea I find fucking bonkers. Whether it's now or whenever, like I, I'm attracted to what I'm attracted to because it's just I'm just born that way. I never made a conscious de- decision to be attracted to women, or even not even just women in general. Because I'm not attracted to every woman. I have a type of person that I'm attracted to, um, and some people have more of a specific type, and some people have more whether it's personality or whatever, but we all have our types, but I didn't choose that. That's just an innate thing. That's just what I like, whether it's from how I was brought up or whether it's just what's in me biologically. And I think that's the same for anybody. Nobody chooses who they like. So it's insane that people would then think that it just wasn't a thing that existed. Like it's just a modern thing that just all of a sudden, because maybe it's more accepted that it's now just popped up and it's a new phenomena. It's like, no, it's fucking always been there. It's just people were unfortunately forced that they had to hide it. But that doesn't mean that, that they didn't choose to like who they who they liked any more than I did. Absolutely. Um, but it's also true that sort of different societies frame what is acceptable in quite different ways. Um, so the sort of modern idea of... Um, gay and lesbian identities um, that did sort of start forming in the 19th century. Um, But that is not the same thing as kind of desire between men or between women. That would have always been there. It's just that it's very, very difficult to speak of a sort of gay or lesbian identity in the Middle Ages because that's not something that was necessarily available to someone. Um, you know, if you were a woman, then it was expected that you got married. Um, and that sort of distinction between straight and gay, um, that wasn't really strongly established. You weren't sort of, there was no sort of cultural space to be gay. There was no cultural space to have a relationship with someone of the same gender. Um, so it it kind of is true that... Um, sexuality um, and gender um, is kind of framed a little bit differently in the Old Norse texts to how it is now. So, for example, in Lokasanna, when um, Loki's going around accusing all of these women of um, sleeping with men who are not their husbands, 
those are transgressive sexual acts in the same way that men sort of get accused of sleeping with other men. Um, and that's also a transgressive sexual act. So these are sort of both things that are kind of outside of the norm, but there's sort of different norms sexually for men and for women. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, I should have a little thought there. The, the only reason it's it's even brought up as an act is because people are doing it. So like, exactly. it, I, I, it, Loki would not say, oh yeah, it's bad for a man to sleep with a man if people weren't doing it, because that's why it's a thing. You don't, it's not just going to say something that's, that nobody is doing. But you made, a, I think you made a really good point there that I probably never even thought about of, of just like, now we have these very clear, well, I say very clear roles. Maybe they're, they're not always so clear, but we have this idea of what like what gay and lesbian are. Like if we just refine everything down to just just those two, um, and we kind of have that idea. But then, that kind of thing, like you said, though that would those those labels probably wouldn't have been around at the time. And then I also made me think like. If I slept with my my wife or women in general like a thousand times and enjoyed it, um, and then slept with a guy once, does that make me gay? Like, that's the question. That, that is exactly yeah, that, that, the that's, question. That's exactly what 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 the, <laughs> in my in my language. That's what what you were saying kind of brought up in my head was like. You know, would that make you? Would that make you then class as a homosexual man? I don't. I would say absolutely not. No, it doesn't. I would say by now, by modern terms, you would be classed as bisexual, I guess. But maybe you're straight and you experimented. I don't think it makes you anything. I don't think I, my personal opinion is not everything needs a fucking label. We all just want to put labels on everything. But who really gives a fuck? Just do what you want to do. Who cares? Um, but everyone wants to have a little label on something now. So. Yeah, I don't think they would have just had these labels as much. Maybe they were just like, it wouldn't have been that you were gay. It was just like, oh, that one act is seen negatively. So we're going to give you shit for that one act you did. But maybe it doesn't have to become your whole thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, and this is a big part of uh, queer theory, which I'm kind of using a lot to try and sort of get into all of these gender questions um and it exactly sort of goes along the lines of, of what you were saying um of, of looking at these binaries you know men women and gay and straight and sort of firstly sort of looking at how they're constructed in uh, modern society um so you know what exactly does it take for someone to be gay can you just identify as gay, even if you've never slept with, if you're a man and you've never slept with another man. Um, does it make you gay if you sleep with another man one time? Um, and, you know, who, you know, somebody can put themselves in one box and somebody who, you know, does the same thing um, or is attracted to the same people can put themselves in a completely different box. Um, and, I, you know, I guarantee there is someone listening to this right now and has just gone, yeah, you're gay, and just turned this off. Someone <laughs> listening to this will have just been, have been of like of that mindset and just gone, yeah, it makes you gay, and just turned it off. Guarantee there will be one person. And if you're still listening, fuck you. But if not... Uh, if probably, it was that simple, gone. if it was that simple, we wouldn't need to have any of these conversations. <laughs> it's not. It's, yeah, again, it's uh, for me, it's just... I mean, I find it very fascinating in a sense of looking back and seeing what we can learn about people, how people thought in the Viking Age and how it, it and what we can learn from the the mythology and the, and the literature. But when it really comes down to it, particularly in like my own life in modern times, like just to stop giving a fuck what other people do. Like, who cares? Just care just do what you want to do like what someone else is doing doesn't really matter as long as it's not illegal and it's not it's not direct yeah it's just like it always brings this this idea to my mind of like probably when i was a kid more uh, this idea of i'm i'm 34 
So I think when I was younger, like things were just starting to make a shift. I think there was a lot more open um, homophobia when I was a kid. And I think the, the, it's this idea that's always I found fascinating is that when you had like, particularly maybe like young lads, if like there was a gay person, it's like, oh, well, they definitely fancy me. And it's like, how fucking arrogant do you have to be to have that mindset that you think every gay person on the planet fancies you and would be interesting? Like, it, but it's that, it's just that mindset. I don't know where it comes from and why it's there. And it's just this shitty, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like straight men that are terrified of getting hit on by a gay man, even though they hit on women all the time. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'll be honest, I get hit on by gay men all the time. I'm a I I'm a type for for a gay man. And I anybody listening to this, if you don't know what I look like, I I have a beard. I've got a hairy chest. I'm I certainly fall into the bear category to put it put it bluntly. And all my life, I've always been hit on by elder not elderly women, but like women are much older than me. So like when I was in my early twenties, like people like my mum's age, ladies and mums always used to find me attractive, and then gay men and i just found, always found it so flattering i was like yeah and i'm like wonderful you thank you very much i find that that's a it's a compliment i'm not like oh yeah now he's gonna try it's just yeah i don't know i've i find how people think sometimes very odd yeah it's all about your mindset i think i think some people have very kind of fixed ideas we're very kind of attached to this idea of kind of gender and sexuality being kind of natural um or sort of coming sort of even a religious idea that sort of comes from god and mm -hmm. you know the, the way i look at it the reality is that you know different societies have different concepts of what it is to be a man or a woman um and what sort of sexuality is um and I think people sort of feel threatened by the idea that these things might shift or that they might not sort of always be the same or that different people might have different concepts. Yeah, it's people are fascinating, aren't they? People are for, for you know, this in all different ways, whether it's for shit reasons or, or not, people just will never stop fascinating me. Uh, OK, so we've been off topic for a little bit back to, I guess, to the earlier question that we can finish on is this idea of Loki has just kind of blown up in popularity. I, I think anyway, I don't know whether maybe it's because of the Marvel movies or, or what, but there seems to be a real subsect of modern pagans who would claim Loki as like their deity. He's, he's the one that they kind of identify with and they would worship Loki and obviously, as you said, as you said earlier, there isn't any kind of historical sites of worship to Loki from from the Viking Age. Um, so yeah, I wonder what, what you where you thought that might have come from. This idea, because there is a lot of idea of like, well, Loki being like a misunderstood god, and you, I guess you kind of touched on it and maybe alluded to earlier of maybe your own idea of of Loki of how he's misunderstood and maybe mistreated a little bit and is not quite the I, I want to I would say demonic figure I, I want to avoid like devil and I, I don't want to maybe attach him to to like the Christian Satan but that kind of demonic evil figure yeah, there's so many theories floating out there about sort of what Loki really is or where Loki comes from and this demonic idea that he's sort of um, a version of, of Satan taken over from Christianity is one of them. But I think what is fascinating about Loki is that he's actually really hard to pin down. Um, he's good sometimes. He's very helpful to the other gods. He, um, you know, he's the one that brings uh, Odin his spear and Thor his hammer and Sif her golden hair, but only after he's cut it all off. That that's my that would be my argument is that you when if you do things after doing something shitty, is it really doing something nice, or is it doing something nice because you have to now to fix the shitty thing? 
Well, he did get threatened with torture if he didn't replace Sif's hair. So well, th- that that even more so. I guess coercion is it coercion? Is that the right word? Yeah, I think it is. If is coercion like a, you know, if I if somebody came in here and held a gun to my head and said, "Give all your money to charity," am I really selfless and giving all my money to charity, or am I just being forced into it? Yeah, I'd say there's a bit of both. Um, no, I, I'm telling I mean, you now, I'm not being well, nice not, by giving you charity. Not, not, not in your case. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you've got a gun to your head. Um, I know. I'm. I'm kidding. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I mean. Loki's kind of, you can kind of take what you want from Loki. You can read into him whatever you want. There's even in academia, there's sort of a theory that Loki's actually an air spirit, that he's actually a water spirit, that he's actually a fire spirit, that he's actually like a vegetation deity or exonic earth deity, um, or that he's actually a spider or that he's actually a devil. You know, there's all of these different interpretations of what he really is and i think at the end of the day he is sort of lots of different things um you know he does shift um and he sort of does attack the gods and he does turn against them um but sometimes he's also helpful to them um when he doesn't necessarily have to be or when he's not um threatened by torture um, or, you know, when he does replace his hair, he also brings the gods a bunch of other gifts that he didn't have to. And he is counted, he's sort of counted as, you know, last and least, but he's still one of the Aesir. Um, He's still kind of one of the gods. I feel like you're definitely a lucky sympathizer. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're studying him, so I, I would be uh, surprised if you weren't. <laughs> I, I mean, no, I... Is it okay? Here's an idea. Is it possible that Loki is maybe just an explanation for the unknown? Because I guess, particularly in a time when you don't have science to explain things for you, um, you know, maybe Sif's hair could be an explanation for, I don't know, if alopecia existed at the time, but I, it's, it's a human condition, so possibly it did. So maybe somebody's hair fell out. So he was like, oh, it's that that tricky, mischievous Loki, or maybe, you know, Ragnarok is, and Matthias would have said for a volcanic eruption that happened, what, in like the three, four hundreds or whatever, whatever it was, he, he says it all the time. Uh, but, you know, a, a giant cataclysmic eruption or an event. But yeah, is it possible that that's, or, or you know, famine, the, 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 ha- the, the crops not rising, that it's just this kind of, one size fit all solution of this mischievous god that anything that goes wrong you can just attribute it to this person yeah that's actually one of the theories of myth that you know the whole point of mythologies is to kind of explain natural phenomena and to sort of explain natural world um there's also a related theory that myths are kind of ideology that they kind of set up social norms and they kind of set up how people should behave. Um, and they're maybe not like perfect examples, um, but they're sort of almost like moral tales where they sort of carry this kind of social ideology. Um, and we see with Loki, you know, when he's bound and he has the snake over his face and the, the venom drips into his eyes, that is put down as kind of the explanation for earthquakes. I would, yeah, I was about to ask that if that's, well, I didn't know whether that was like something I just heard or that was something that was in the source material. Yeah, it's um, in the sort of prose um, explanation at the end of Lokasemna, I think, where sort of after he insults all of these gods, they kind of chase him out to the forest and they, mm-hmm. they tie him up um, in this cave. Um, and sort of when he shakes from the pain of this um, yeah. venom in his eyes, that that's what causes earthquakes. Mm-hmm. That, yes. Uh... Yeah, because I'm. I, I tried to put myself as somebody who lived back then without, and it's very difficult to do. Like without the modern, fancy. It's like how would I explain? Because even anybody, I guess anybody that's been in maybe even like a thunderstorm, like a or like a real thunderstorm, and like we understand 
how or why they form. But it's, it's still a little bit like, fuck, this is very humbling. And you're like, it makes you feel almost very insignificant. And, and you know, even now with, with modern technology, it's still a little bit like, oh, that could actually be Thor. I mean, it could be some godlike entity doing that. So back then, it makes complete sense that these just giant events or sometimes just wholly cruel events of somebody maybe just passing away without rhyme or reason just by disease that they don't understand that it's kind of like ah, it's just that look has just been a little shit again yeah i think we've always made up stories to kind of rationalize you know difficult things or overwhelming things mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah i think was it was it with Simon uh Niga? We were talking last last week. I think we were talking about child sacrifice, I think. And and he was saying about how uh the idea of sac like the idea of sacrificing your child is absolutely abhorrent. You know, by modern standards, it's it's you couldn't think of something worse than than a, like a parent or a family sacrificing a, a a baby or a child, but if you then genuinely believed that sacrificing that baby would save your village or have some positive effect for a hundred, two hundred people, it kind of makes it a little bit easier because you're putting some justification to it, and that may be so hard to understand from modern standards. But when you go back to people who genuinely believed in that, it makes it a little bit easier and i guess it could be similar with when when something cruel happens that we just because cruel stuff happens all the time to people and there is no rhyme or reason and it just sucks sometimes life just fucking sucks and something bad happens and there's nobody to blame it's just something shitty just happened and you can't attest it to anybody maybe you know just a natural disaster or an illness and there is nobody to blame and but it's and it hurts and these were still people back then whether it you know, if it's a loved one, it still sucks the same as it sucks for us today. And anybody who's lost someone knows that shitty feeling. And it makes it a little bit easier if you can go, it was fucking your fault. Uh, and it kind of just does make it a little bit more easy to to take and to accept. And I feel like that would be the same then. If something happens that you can't explain, just to go, oh, fucking Loki. Like, just to put a name and a face to it and, a, and an explanation would kind of maybe make the pain a little bit easier or it could be talking shit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we actually don't really have, um, descriptions of, you know, um, rituals or cults so much. I think we have the, the Arabic sources in Fadlan and then we have in the sagas of Icelanders, um, we have some sort of, um, depictions of pagan practice. Um, that can sort of maybe give us together with the archaeology a sort of a little glimpse into how people would have dealt with um these sort of difficult situations but um yeah again just the sources are so few and far between and the i saw that silos are quite late so um yeah again so hard to tell you know what role loki would have played wouldn't have played mm-hmm. um if he even existed that's yeah Oh, that's going to upset so many people. I'm sorry. I mean, but th- at the end of the day, it is what it is. Like, with and 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 again, I I think in modern modern time, modern days, people have to learn to be fucking upset sometimes, and not everything is how you want it to be. And that's the thing. But some people would just listen to this and go, and they just get so upset, and then they turn it off. And they would like if you'd said that at the beginning, there would be some people who would just go. I'm not fucking listening to this. She clearly does has no idea what she's talking about. Turn it off and just gone. Fuck off. Because that's unfortunately what some people are like. But at the end of the day, because they don't want to have what they know challenged, even if what they've learned is very basic and kind of from TV shows, they don't want to have that challenged. Um, but it takes people like yourself that are completely objective and read it and learn and remove all your feelings and just go, well, what can we learn from this? 
Yeah, and there's always going to be different opinions um, on pretty much everything. Even, you know, among the academics, you know, you can get two different experts on in the same field and they'll have, they'll tell you completely different things. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they're both right. Maybe neither of them are right. Maybe only one of them is. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's always important to be able to have a kind of respectful um, discussion mm -hmm. um, about yeah. stuff. And, yeah, I think. Oh, people in general just need to learn to be uncomfortable in not knowing things sometimes. We don't have to know everything. It's nice to not know. Yeah. There's it's... a lot we don't know about the Viking Age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I try to think about how many hours I've sat here and spoken to to people and then someone else will come on and be like, what? No, stop it. Why? I thought I knew that. I thought like I was pretty set on that little bit. And like, you know, yeah, nope. Like, well, even with this, I assumed that Loki, we knew that Loki was a pre-Christian deity or figure. And then you're like, no, nah, maybe it didn't even exist back then. Like, oh, what do you mean? I thought I knew that. I thought that was like a thing. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the whole point of research as well, to kind of upset what we thought we knew and kind of think, oh, well, you know, this is the established view on this. But what if we look at it from a different angle or sort of, you know, what if um, we kind of upset this idea or, you know, I don't think that that person is right. Let's let's take a different approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I enjoy it. I'm happy to be kind of like, you know what? I don't know. I'm just enjoying learning and listening. And kind of having these these conversations, but yeah, let's yeah let's wrap this up. It's been it's been a lot of fun, and we'll jump over and do a Q and A with the patrons if you've got 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so anybody listening, if you want to listen to the Q and A after this, and we do this with every guest we have on, we have a quick Q and A after, and those episodes go up on Patreon. So it's literally just Patreon for us Nordic mythology podcast. It's three pound a month and you can listen to the whole back catalog of all the guests we've done Q and A's with. And there's a lot of information in there. And sometimes I ask more questions or sometimes the guests go off and tell their own little stories. So they, they do, they are a lot of fun and they add a little extension. Really they're, they're, they're labeled as a Q and A, but they're probably just like an extra 20 minutes of a, of a podcast episode. We just extend on and, and carry on talking there. So if you do want to get those, it is just Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast. And yeah, if you enjoy the show, please leave a five-star rating and a positive review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us just at Nordic Mythology Podcast across the board on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and everywhere, pretty much. Um, Ella, is there, where can people follow you if you want people to follow you? Um, they can follow me at uh, my name on Twitter, I think that's pretty much my main kind of online presence. Yeah. It, Twitter, Twitter definitely does seem to be the one for scholars. Like I, I don't have Twitter. And that probably says something because I'm <laughs> not a scholar. Um, but yeah, it always it does seem to be very strong amongst amongst you lot. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it do. Um perfect. Okay. Is there anything else you think people need to know before we before we go? We... I I think I'm good. Yeah, it's been a yeah. fun um, hour and a half. It's been yeah, great talking fine. to you. So how's it been? Has it flown by? Um, I, yeah, I, I don't have my watch on today, so it was this was going to go as long as it went. But um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And like I say, if you want to hear us talk a little bit more, we have the the bonus episodes over on Patreon. And yeah, we'll go do that now.